by Riverside. Welcome to Dance Talk with Joanne Carey, where the dance world connects, the conversations inspire, and where we are keeping them real. I'm your host, Joanne Carey, and today I am joined with Carl Flink. I'm excited to have him here today. He is not only a dancer and a choreographer, he is also an academic. He is a professor, I believe, or associate professor out in Minneapolis, and he is currently working on a new program with his company called Black Label Movement. That'll be premiering, if I'm not mistaken, um, entitled Battleground, which we'll get to later. But he has a really interesting background. And also, I understand, I believe you are a lawyer, if I'm not mistaken. I, I was a practicing attorney when I left um, the Lamone Company in New York in the late 90s. I went to law school and actually got a JD and was a practicing attorney for about three and a half years. But during the whole time in law school and uh, when I moved here to Minneapolis to pick up my my staff attorney job I, I continue to dance and choreograph and things of that nature yeah great well we we can get more into that but what I'd like to do is have you introduce yourselves a little bit a little bit more to the listeners so sure. let's start at the beginning Carl how did you get involved in dance what was that moment where you knew dance is what you wanted to do for your career um, take us on that journey with you yeah, that can be a complicated question because there's many moments um, yes. to start. I could start when I first saw a, a video of Gene Kelly singing in the rain and that oh. me to go into my basement for like a month and uh, and, and do that. Um, and so that was when I was about you know nine or 10. And then I also remember being in a creative movement class where I made an incredible elephant. But if we're thinking more, more. No, I love those stories. Yeah. I love those stories. Yeah. Um, but I, I think maybe the point of that is to long before I became a dance artist, there were all these moments of movement that mm -hmm. kind of popped up in my life. But my primary movement space or discipline when I was growing up was sports. I was a very serious soccer player mm -hmm. and, um, all the way into college. But when I got to the University of Minnesota, I just was looking through the dance catalog there. I mean, the, the course catalog. Mm -hmm. And there was um intro to modern dance class. And I I had always, at that time, there were a number of athletes in the professional ranks who were exploring dance as a way to improve agility, things mm -hmm. of that nature. And I said, why not? Let's. I'm going to go for this. And um, I took the class and it kind of, was one of those lightning bolt moments where I realized, oh my gosh, there's all this physicality that doesn't need a ball to to um, to be involved. And so I went from never having taken a dance class when you know, up to when I was almost 20 years old to shifting to dancing about 30 plus hours a week within a month, and suddenly got into pieces and things of that nature. Because one of the things I showed fairly early on was a aptitude for partnering. And so yeah. I really enjoyed lifting and partnering and, and all of all of its permutations. And so that allowed me to find my way into a bunch of, of work um, with uh, fellow dance students at the University of Minnesota and then some of the companies here in, in town, maybe most prominently a company called New Dance Ensemble, where I was an apprentice. Interestingly enough, at the University of Minnesota, they have an amazing program that is called the Cole's Guest Artist Chair. And Susan McGuire from Paul Taylor's company. Mm -hmm came as a guest artist to set Paul's Esplanade and yeah. Susan um, cast me in, in, in kind of one of the primary roles. And after that residency, just took me out to dinner and said, I think you need to move to New York. And I was like, I've been dancing for three years. I'm going to go be a political science oh, wow. scientist somewhere. And she said, no, you need to move to New York. And interestingly enough, I literally listened to her. And six months later, I, I moved to New York. And yeah. You know, so it had been, you know, maybe an arc of about three, three and a half years. But it is interesting to say, like, I literally was dancing anywhere between 30 and 45 hours a week, just constantly. Any dance class I could get into, any ballet class I could get in, any African diaspora yeah. class. It just was every, I was just, like, insatiable while I was still playing soccer and doing my yeah. degrees. 
And then, and so when I went to move to New York, things, I, I thought I would be there for like six months pretending to be an artist and then get on with my life. And, um, but I, I, quick, I, I auditioned for a project with Patricia Nanon, who is the founder of The Yard. And she was doing a retrospective concert and she hired me and that was a wonderfully paying gig. And that then turned into multiple other gigs, particularly working with Janice Brenner um, was one of the key pieces that came out of that. And so things just spiraled there. Paul um, had put me on scholarship right away at his studio. And so this just was, I just went to New York and went from, you know, zero to a hundred, just dancing everywhere, yeah. dancing at steps on Broadway as a scholarship student. And so I, I was in a situation where I actually didn't have to pay for class very much because I had all these wonderful options. And so it was kind of like it was I was living a dream life. I had no money, but I didn't have to pay for anything, uh, you know, other yeah. than. And so, um, you know, about, you know, I, I was auditioning, you know, for, you know, I pretty much went to any audition I could. I got into a beautiful company that in some ways is my aesthetic poem, which is uh, Terry Creech and Steve Kester's company mm -hmm. called Creech Kester Men Dancing. And they're a very mm -hmm. partnering and highly physical company. And they just had such an impact on me. But about a little over a year, no one was kind of leaving the company at Paul at, Paul's at that time. And so I auditioned for the Lamont Company, basically because I heard that if you got through the first day, you got a free one-week residency. Because I had never really taken any any Lamont classes or anything. I had an appreciation for the style, but I wasn't familiar. And I was very much a Paul Taylor style oh, dancer. Sorry? I was the most fluid person on earth. Not to say that Taylor dancers aren't fluid. Mm -hmm. Not I understand, in, yeah. Not in the Lamone way. Different and style, yeah. Different styles. And um, but I, I did manage to get through the first day because they did some jumping phrases at the end of the day. And I, and I was a, a, a big jumper at that time. And then, you know, it, it, that it kind of went from there. I, the, I, I basically we had a residency that went eight hours a day, learning all kinds of um, uh, material from Betty Jones, repertory from people in the company. Um, and then, it, uh, you know, and I, and I kind of said, wow, this is going OK. But there was 10 of us and I was the one guy from the soccer player from Minnesota and all the rest yeah. of the guys were from Juilliard or SUNY Purchase. Yeah. I was dutifully um, impressed and intimidated. But I, I mean, I did see that I had a different a different style. What's but the, the funny thing that happened is the last day, the ask was that we bring a solo that was either made on us that, or that we had made ourselves. And I, had, I was working with a downtown choreographer in Manhattan um, named Nina Winthrop at the time. And we had created an improvisatory uh, score where it was essentially me being in the hallway, being slammed around the hallway by an invisible hand. And I didn't know this at the time, but they made an order for the last day of these of sharing these solos. And I was the last one to go. I'm a pretty naive person to dance at this point. I didn't really realize that that might have meant something that they were really interested in me. Sure. Interested in. I just assumed that it was just an order. Yeah. And so everybody went and they were stunning. They were just, and it was all very much in the world of classical modern dance and yeah. flying and turning. And so I, you know, I, I got up and I said, okay, well, we're going to have the postmodern offering for the day. And I gave Carla Maxwell, who was the artistic director at that time, I gave her my cassette because I'm old enough to give a cassette. Cassette. And, and I said, you know, and I really appreciate having had the opportunity to be here. And then proceeded to stand two feet away from Carla. And the first thing I do is throw myself as far back as I could and land on my back and then flop around the room for another two minutes. And I got up and I thought, huh, okay, we're done. You know, I mean, that, that, that's it for me. But it's been a great residency and blah, blah, blah. But the long and short of it is um, Carla called me up the next day and she said, you know, we were really interested in you. And we really knew that there was something about how you move that you know we hadn't seen necessarily in the Lamone space or that you might offer a different voice. And then you did that solo. And I thought that was the moment she was going to say, and thus we're not going to hire you. And she said, and it was the solo that made the decision because she said, um, I'd never... I, not to say that was necessarily new, but she said, I'd just never seen something like that in an audition. Yeah. And, I, and because the Lamone Company isn't just about Lamone rep, but they, have, yeah. they bring in all kinds of artists. She said, I wanted that kind of flexibility. In, I was going to say in, a freedom, right? A real freedom. You know, mm -hmm. that, 
kind of that spirit of exploration. And, and so the surprise of all of it is I just, you know, in a short five day period, having never really been exposed to Limon, I found myself a week later in my first rehearsal with the Limon company wow. getting ready for performances at Jacob's Pillow. And wow. it really wasn't, it was an unexpected journey because I was very much immersed in the, in the Taylor world. I had done okay. a solo project with Paul called Epic for a okay. performance at the Lincoln Center, okay. you know, kind of thought that would be the workplace I would be. And then suddenly Lamone came along and it yeah. honestly was such a unexpected direction change just from a movement standpoint that it, it helped me evolve as a dancer, as a choreographer in ways that I, I truly didn't expect. It also allowed me to kind of fuse the, the classical modern dance of Taylor and Lamone with these downtown scenes. Mm -hmm. I was doing with Beach Kester and other companies and it just, and Janice Brenner and Joanna Mendel Shaw. And so it just turned out to be the kind of unexpected left turn in my career that kind of changed everything for me. But wow, I could go on, but that's kind of a, the, no, that's, it, you know. it's fascinating. I mean, I, I just want to back up a little bit. So yeah. at this point, just, just remind me, do you have your degree in political science? Yeah. So yeah, I, you so you finished. Yeah, so I at the I graduated from the University of Minnesota, and okay. my degrees were actually um, political science and women's studies. And women's so studies. I'm a, um, a unapologetic feminist, and a, I try to infuse that perspective in 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 kind of the work of and the culture of my company, Black Label Movement. Yeah, so I I, I did I I do have that the double you degree. You had that before yeah. you went to New York. Well, the yeah, reason I, I I managed to finish before I I moved to yeah. That's the reason I asked that because my undergrad degree was political science. I was a double major in pol political science in French. Right. So, so yeah. when I saw that, I was like, "How interesting, political science!" You know. So I was just wondering about that. And I would imagine your sports background, all your mm -hmm. soccer playing, contributed also to your way of movement. Do you feel like it did? Yeah. I mean, there was. There, were, there was a time I used to joke that my original school of dance was soccer okay. or what I would prefer to call football, right, um, but right. I, we'll stay with soccer in our American context. But yeah, because um, literally I was a very serious player playing in select teams and such like okay. that through high school and then played at, at the collegiate level for one year before I kind of decided to step away. So, so, wow. Um, uh I, for me, I've always, since I was about six years old, been in a highly disciplined physical space. Uh -huh. So I, when I say to someone that I started dancing just before I turned 20, I don't feel like that's actually such an accurate statement. I, that's when I form, started taking classes, Formal. formally labeled dance classes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But I've always been very dedicated to physical exploration. Athletics is that. Okay. Okay. challenging yourself trying to find different virtuosities to achieve different things learning about dynamics and movement so uh -huh. you know that's why you know wh where did i start dancing maybe it's when i was six maybe it's when i saw gene kelly maybe it's when oh. i made that elephant you know but um yeah. so it feels like all of those things and certainly my aesthetic with black label movement is if i were to describe it is very much driven by my experiences with paul taylor and the limon company with Preach Kester and with soccer and, okay. and other sports. But soccer, that kind of that weaving of the formality, formalisms of um, classical modern uh -huh. and the kind of deconstruction of postmodern yes. spaces. Uh -huh. Collision, I'll even use that word collision with, uh -huh. um, with athletic. In particular, you know, soccer is not necessarily seen as an impact sport, but it has a, an immense amount of physicality in it. Yeah. And so I really love that kind of the rawness of mm -hmm. sports. And I love okay. to try to bring that out in, in my work, which is very much the case with the work we might talk yes, about. Yes, I, I, you know, the way you've explained it and the reading I was doing on you, I see that because I also thought I was like, gee, there's an element of performance art almost to it. There's definitely that postmodern yep. and, and just like that rawness is a really good description that you have. Uh, you know, I'm also wondering the the title, Black Label Movement. Tell yeah. me about the, how you came up with that. 
Sure. One of the things I love about Black Label Movement is people actually ask you. It's a little different what? than Carl Flink Dance Theater, right? Yeah, yeah. And so where where did it come from? Um, multiple levels. That The name is actually meant to have many layers to it. But there was a, a famous cult movie, I think, early 80s called Repo Man. I don't mm-hmm. know if you remember it. I do not it. know that. My husband might, but I do not. It's, it's kind of a famous punk rock okay. cult movie that it's a science fiction movie. It, it features a, a young Emilio Estevez, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which is a punker, um, which mm-hmm. is interesting. And um, Harry Dean Stanton is also figures prominently. The two of them are repo men in L.A. It's a very convoluted story because it also invo- uh, involves alien contamination and all these things. None of that matters other than the fact that featured in those movies is the, is the generic food aisle. And I, I don't know if you remember those, but I, when I was growing up, generic foods didn't have branding like they have now. You walked yeah. into an aisle that was only generic foods, and they were mm-hmm. either white or yellow labeled mm-hmm. products. Just say fruit cocktail, oh, tea, okay. corn. And so you just have like this bank yeah. of white labeled projects with black lettering on them. And my friends and I called them black label foods. And what we loved, what I always loved about them wasn't the genericness of them, but the fact that you got what you saw. You yeah. weren't getting the Jolly Green Giant. You were just getting green peas. And, and it was just canned food. And so that kind of no-nonsense, you know, kind of acid-washed aesthetic of just doing the thing really felt in tune with the um, kind of movement, movement aesthetic I, I wanted. And then I just I think it's interesting that you 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 mentioned that you see different kind of modes of making in my in my work mm-hmm. because I am not overly concerned about whether what I do is considered dance. Mm-hmm. I want it driven by movement, and mm-hmm. and that could be movement like soccer. It could be movement as uh, as beautifully delicate and graceful as one of Jose's greatest works choreographic offering or something like that and so to me but i also love going back to our political science this idea of a movement of the idea of a collective of a a group of people Uh coming together to move together to represent maybe concepts and ideals that we believe in and so i wanted the the name of the company to, to reflect not simply an individual voice but more of a a collective voice because we've had other choreographers make on the company and uh-huh. we now have a um uh, we inaugurated a season last year called movers make where we commissioned seven of our community members in the company to create new premieres and so we're really trying to be a group that is interested highly physical driven and raw uh-huh. dance making i mean in some ways i i come from that kind of these postmodern world in some ways, but I would describe myself not so much as a postmodern minimalist, but as a postmodern maximalist. Yeah, I think that's a good description. I do, you know, because just a little bit, I looked and, and your TED Talks and, and those types of things, I could see that. And it, you know, love, you know, my background was modern. I danced with a modern yeah. company, but then sure. I fell in love with ballet. You know, you have that ballet and I fell in love yeah. with ballet. Now, like ballet's my scene, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. But I tell you, with modern, I love the improvisational aspect of it. Mm-hmm. And I love that freedom of it. And when I was watching clips of things of yours, I saw that. And it it made me laugh, not laugh at, but laugh like I thought, oh, gosh, I remember that freedom. And, and I remember when I would be teaching my students. And at first, if they weren't familiar with improvisation, they would be like, oh, my gosh, what are we doing? Until sure. they really got the sense of freedom that it gives you an exploration. But then such great stuff came yeah. out of improvisation. 100%. So, yeah. So when you're teaching, I just want to segue a little bit to your teaching there at the university. Do you do you, I'm assuming it's modern. Is it is it a lot of modern that you're Is it a modern program? Yeah. I mean, yeah oh, yeah. Our, so the University of Minnesota Dance Program, where I'm the director, is definitely i think we would actually say we've shifted a little away from that modern centered focus Mm -hmm. too much to a a contemporary focus and okay we certainly go down the hole of what is the difference what's Um, the difference yeah yeah i mean i think one of the ways i would just quickly describe the difference is in our contemporary track we have ananya chatterjee 
uh, exploring contemporary forms through uh, classical Indian um, uh, training. We have Tritty, who's coming from a house hip hop perspective. We okay. have Carlo Villanueva um, coming from you know Bill T. Jones and a yep. highly highly uh, balletic. Well, Athletic versus Cunningham background, so many different ranges, and so why, why I think we needed to move away from that modernist term is modern really, modern is really an era, and there's there's yeah. forms to it. Jose Limon, Paul Taylor, all yeah. of these things, Elvin Ailey, Horton, all of those spaces, and and so we we have that contemporary focus, but we also our dance majors can, um, in their degrees, uh, layer hip hop ballet american jazz african diaspora right now tap is on a hiatus um oh, but it's but, but we really believe in this idea of kind of contemporary lensing of multiple of multiple forms yeah. and so my teaching can range from i can come in and teach a pure Lamone paul taylor company mm-hmm. uh, paul taylor yeah. class, but i can um but but then it can range into a, a, a full 90 minutes of improvisation driven mm-hmm. um you know very clear uh uh imagistic um facilitation and things of that nature and so what i what i work with with my students is to try to prepare them for this whole idea of like how do you sink into a form mm-hmm. but how do you also find that individual movement signature that comes up comes out of your body and and try to find the interesting balance between those between yeah, I mean that that that's fascinating, and I I find that it's such it goes into a deeper level. I find that that you really tap into. It sounds like what you're describing. You're really like having a student really like uncover the depth of exploration within their own movement, within what makes them move. And this is the one thing I I find myself when I, when I'm talking to people too, just in general. You know, modern. You don't have to have music, right? You don't have to. It's. I don't think you need which, to have ballet either. I mean, yeah. you know, I, yeah. I mean, just just so you know that I actually very early on when I started training, one of the big things I added into my life was about fifteen to twenty hours of ballet um, okay. every, day, every week, and 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 then I studied with a, a, a choreographer in New York. Another choreographer who offered me free classes as long as I would come in and lift people. Uh, Francis Petrelli. Okay. was a, a really significant impact on me just because my body first of all does not read I, my body reads as a football linebacker or a soccer uh, defender and and it still does and it always has but i found people who allow my body to sit That's in right. ballet and find that kind of rigor um, which really helped inform all, all of these other spaces yeah and so I, I see the value of that of that interlacing of multiple forms. Yep. Yeah. You know, and all the various dance forms that I've had the opportunity to be in. Yeah, which I find fascinating. And I and I also think I think you are and it sounds I just from what I read about you and what you're saying, I think you have this mind that sees and interprets things in a way that translates them into movement. Which I think it's fascinating, you know, because not everybody can dive that, can do that deep dive, I should say. And I, it sounds like you, you have your students and offer that to your students to really find that because everybody wants to find their own sense of artistry. Everybody wants to explore that and have that voice. And I think in order to do that, you do have to go internally to find that external. If I'm saying that, saying that. I think it's beautiful, Joanne. I, 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 you know, at the end of the day, it's always good to remember those wise ones in your life who yeah. have given you information that, that you then synthesize in different ways. One of my first dance teachers here at the University of Minnesota, which is where I graduated from, it's interesting to be back here. There was no yeah. plan, um, was a wonderful dance artist named Maria Chang. Okay. And I remember when I was first dancing and, and, and she could tell I was really like loving it. But what did that even mean? You know, yeah. in my life, because there was no idea that this was something in my future um i mean i literally can say if you talk to my 19 year old self and said you're going to be a dance artist <laughs> when you're in your 50s uh, i i would say you're a, a very crazy human being right i mean in that yeah. and so that's how like day and night this was um, but i asked her I, I you know i said what is modern dance what is all of what yeah. is this this kind of experimental 
world of movement. And, and she said, well, it's learning how you move. Yay. And that just stuck. Like, yeah. when, where, wherever, and, the, and that actually, it was a moment of permission. Mm-hmm. I, I looked at everybody, you know, wrapping their legs around their head, you yeah. know, and I'm, you're barely able to touch my, the middle of my mom's shins when I was first dancing. And I was like, and they kept putting me in these advanced classes because I picked up stuff. Yeah. I was like, what am I doing here? But I did start to realize, like, there were things that those amazingly flexible human beings around me just couldn't do. They couldn't just run. They couldn't just jump and just go for it. And yeah. as it was, so I began to realize, like, there's a, even though I don't fit a mold, there's a place for me here, especially yeah. in this idea of modern dance is about discovering how you move. And, yeah. and, I, and that's literally stitched through everything I've done. My company knows that once I, if I give them movement, the expectation is that they're going to run mm-hmm. and that if they have new ideas, they're going to propose it. And so mm-hmm. it becomes this very synergistic idea of making rather than simply setting. And I have no yeah. problem with people who like to just set work. If that is the mode that you're in, fantastic. But I just love this fast paced um, back and forth. And, you know, as you know, my company you know, says to each other, like, just don't ever do anything in the room you don't want to do. Yeah. It just, <laughs> right. I mean, it's going to show up. Creating, if we're creating a good and a creative space, okay. they're going to be making in the soup of ideas that we're talking about. And so it really, yeah. I want to listen. It's not just proposals don't just come from words. They come from the body and the, and the choices that are happening. And so it's, mm-hmm. yeah, that, so that, that kind of, it's both improvisation, but also willingness to see the extrapolations and interpolations that exist even in set phrases. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. You know, it's exciting. When I hear you talk, it's exciting because it just brings me back to those modern days of those, you know, company rehearsals where you were, you were creating, you know, the choreographer wasn't coming. He might have a phrase that he was giving us, but then we took that phrase and we were doing all kinds of exploration with it. And then he would be like, that's great. Yes. Let's do that. You know, or, and, and the fact that you, I, I love that you said you were a great lifter, <laughs> you know, a great, because, because that was, that was one of the things I enjoyed about, um, you know, the modern company was, was those, those times where those shifting of the body weight and whoever was lifting, you know, it, it was an, it was a great experience to have that different from, I had said to somebody over the summertime, cause I was working on the ballet over the summertime and yeah. I had never, never been lifted did by a ballet partner i said i've had tons of modern partners men women whatever lift me in some type of modern lift but it was never a traditional ballet lift. and they were like really i was like no i had never had that experience of being just lifted through the air in an arabesque or whatever i said but contort me and i was lifted through the air you know so it's a it's an experience it certainly is an experience it is an experience and it's a it's a different way of knowing, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, especially in this post-COVID world and a, a world where, you know, we really are having really important conversations about contact in the classroom, contact in a, mm-hmm. in a rehearsal space. But this idea of when we can safely and thoughtfully bring people into contact and you're lifting someone and, and, and or they're moving you or you're being lifted by three people, mm-hmm. it's a, it's, it is a way of communication. It's a way of knowing yeah. each other that isn't, that 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 verbal communication communication doesn't always yeah. fully fully encompass the yeah. all the all the pieces of knowing that you can have and it it really I mean partnering is the thing that I was like wow because so much of what my physical contact with people up to that time had been running into and running down other people on a soccer field right and, yeah, you know right. I, I'd like to say I was a particularly graceful soccer player, but I was more often kind of the, the guy who, when the other guy did something to our player, I would go and say, hey, you don't get to do right. that. You know, <laughs> a little more rough and tough, rough yeah. and tumble contact. And to have this kind of beautifully caring and sensitive and trusting contact between a male, female, the full spectrum yeah. of genders in a, in a space, it's just. It was like, my gosh, the world can be this. Yeah. 
and it and and I and I think that in some ways is one of the things that still keeps driving me is how do we find that type of uh, beautiful community through physical movement and 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 contact. Yeah, let's talk about your upcoming performance. Um, yeah. I believe it is in October, correct? It's yeah. coming up soon, and it's a piece called Battleground. So, can you? What can you tell us about? It? Yeah. Well, I think we'll have we'll have wonderful nerdy moments about political science here, um, <laughs> and, and many of the layers. So, Battleground has been a is in some ways a piece that I've been making for many many years. Like many many dance makers, sure. you're often in the same piece. I think I have a real breadth of pieces because of the TED Talks and all these okay. things. But because of my sports background, I've always had a real fascination with him. This also connects to this now over 10-year um, collaboration I have with a biomedical engineer here at the University of Minnesota, David Odie, okay. where we do a thing called body storming, where we rapid model scientific research using mm -hmm. bodies, space, and time, and things of that nature. In order to do that work with David, we realized that his vision of an interior of a cell was a very uh, volatile place where par particles were hitting and bouncing off mm -hmm. each other all the time. And what I, I, I saw a synthesis moment between my sports background and his research, which was how do we take athletic-level impact and bring it into a research space to enact the mechanisms inside of a cell where wow. things are bouncing off each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so um, 10 years ago, we created a piece called HIT, which is literally built on the idea of athletic level impact of people kicking each other, people grabbing other people, ramming them into each other, people literally hitting one another in a very non-descriptive way. It's mm -hmm. fast, it's real. The audience hears it. You can feel, see how it's impacting the body. Yeah. And it had a really powerful resonance with audiences when he came out. Uh, dialing forward 10 years, I, I, I realized that one of the things that I have been wrestling with um, in the last, you know, maybe in some ways since I left college and while I was a social justice attorney is kind of the reality of what I would describe and others have described as America's forever war. The fact that our country has been some type of military action, police action in many ways since at least the end of World War II. Um, and, and that Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, put forward this idea of beware the military industrial complex. Eisenhower wasn't anti-war, but what he, what he was worried about was this idea of a military complex kind of organizing our society. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I, through my academic re um, time as a political science um, scientist, when I was in law school at Stanford doing international conflict resolution yeah. courses, you began to see just the kind of the through line of how kind of the American military complex, again, not judging it good or bad, just saying it exists and it organizes a lot of how we are in the world. Mm -hmm. And realize, like, you know, here you and I, I sit in this beautiful dance building, you're in your wonderful office, and we're talking about dance and all these beautiful things, yet there are young men and women in the U.S. military who are being shot at, shooting at other people. There's global mm -hmm. conflicts all across the world. But we don't really talk about it mm -hmm. as how that, forever war sits in our bodies and i wanted to create a piece that is about that. what it what does it mean for young bodies to be in a young and you know you know multi-layered bodies to be in a space where they're experiencing aggressive behavior between themselves they're experiencing it not on a dance studio but in a 10 inch deep pit with 10 inches of freshly tilled soil yeah. which is pulling at their legs, making everything harder. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to create a world where, dance, a, a movement world, where we're really seeing these young bodies in aggressive and volatile action with each other? I'm not saying they're at war. I'm not mm -hmm. saying they're fighting. I'm saying they're, they're doing these really intense things that have a sense of aggression, violence, 
Uh -huh. and, and it's also can be really compelling to watch. And I wanted to create a piece that would spark conversation uh -huh. about where we are in 2024 as an, as an American culture that has really accepted this idea of the military industrial complex. What sounds interesting to me, and, and this, this is my own interpretation of what you're saying, as I'm visualizing what you're saying, is, you know, that you're talking about, or perhaps this is just what I'm getting from it, is, you know, how we, being in this type of world, you know, this, yeah. since you said, since Eisenhower, you yeah. know, that it's in, it's in our body, like it's, it, yeah. it's the reactions that we're holding within us, it's that interior stuff. Even on our day-to-day -day basis of, you know, you pick up on someone's energy, you feel, you walk into a room and perhaps you were peaceful in the morning, but the energy around you is agitated or right. the energy around you is peaceful or somebody, you know, looks at you and you interpret it a certain way and it's not particularly that. And you are taking that experience, which is, which is really profound. I mean, I, I really... This is what I find fascinating about both what you intellectually are talking about and describing and what it seems like you put into your work is it's such a profound way of thinking and moving and trying to really get into the depth of that. And that's what I feel like you're doing in Battleground. It's while, while I think the audience is going to see, they're going to see what's happening in front of them. It's actually reflecting the internal of what's happening. And then, you know, like you're saying, you want it to spark a conversation of like, wow, is this going on? What am I feeling that way? Am I, and what am I going to do to not have that kind of relationship with the people right. around me? Is that? Right. I think, I think you, 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 you really stated beautifully. You know, we live in fairly chaotic times. We could get into a long political conversation about all of this. But I think we can all agree that the times are remarkably chaotic right now. We have really profound military conflicts happening in Ukraine, Israel and Palestine, and various other locations, Sudan. These things are part of the soup of what we imagistically sure. see all the time. We also see have the realities of the you know the violences in our streets. You know, being being a, a person who is born and raised and currently lives in the city where George Floyd was killed mm -hmm. you, murdered you have you have the legacies of, mm. of those domestic violence realities and the historical violences that exist in our American culture and again we can have long conversations about all of those and and, and the moralities and the issues around them but those energies live in us and in our in our bodies, they've been talking more and more about kind of the, the genetic legacies of domestic violence and things like that oh. and how it's passed on from body to body. Oh, no. We can't assume that this doesn't doesn't oh, no. and so I'm trying to create a piece that allows a person to say, Hey, I feel that and what yeah. is that and, wow that that what I'm seeing right now right there is bringing something out and if suddenly we're in a place where we're talking about it and questioning how our society is organized, well, and that is the opportunity for us to actually think about real change yeah. versus saying, that's bad, that's good, this well, is the way it should be. Here we're saying, I need to heal. There's parts yeah. of me that need to be healed, mm -hmm. and I, people need to be healed, and how we can have that conversation. That, yeah. in a nutshell, is really what Butt Battleground is tr trying to do. I have many political opinions about many things, but with, yeah. with but with with battleground, we're really trying to get at this kind of umbrella layer of what does kind of un the, the reality yeah. of aggressive political action and military action. How does that sit with us, yeah. and and how can we actually dig in and have a vehicle that allows us to share feelings, share you know intellectual thoughts, and and so forth. Yeah. And my question is this, do you then, are you plan? do you offer a solution within the piece? Like, I don't mean a solution to world problems, yeah. but a solution, like, you know, cause your audience is going to say, cause I know when I see a piece and if I see a piece and it's like, I'm like, whoa, what yeah. just happened? You yeah. know, you, you know, you, you take that with you and you, it affects you, you know, but you also want to have, 
there's been times where I'm like, whoa, I, I just, that was a little too dark for me. You know, it was a little too much for me. So the solution, that space of what next for the audience, what next yeah. for your dancers? How are your dancers experiencing working on this? Yeah. I, I, it is, I think that is a deeply insightful question that gets at kind of the profound matter of how do we carry work like this that is trying to touch these really uncomfortable moments. Yeah. We actually literally just reached for our first full draft this past Saturday. We had an audience uh, that showed up of about 125, 30 people to watch, and we had an almost 45-minute discussion after wow. it. Um, my answer for that is multiple. Mm -hmm. I am not trying to give with this piece a kind of a neat answer. Uh -huh. And here's the pathway. I think one of the um, answers to that question is really creating a piece that almost requires people to talk, engage it and ask questions and challenge. Like yeah. I think the idea of inspiring conversation and discourse is as much of a pathway forward as saying, mm -hmm. here's the answer. Mm -hmm. I also think the answer is in how each mover in the in the piece um, there's nine how how each of them because there's the piece has very clear structures but there are all almost they're rigorously improvisational they're able to make choices all the time even though they have very clear vocabulary that uh -huh. they're used and so mover inside of this piece could say today i'm not going to participate in that activity so that, so what you might see when you're watching it on one day, you might see a, a mover stand in the corner and just stay very present mm -hmm. as something else is happening and then rejoin mm -hmm. in. You know, the audience isn't going to know that that wasn't set. But so the movers themselves are creating narratives and, mm -hmm. and not dramatic narratives, mm -hmm. but narratives audience can, a, a, an observer can sit there and say, how is that person processing mm -hmm. this intense space? It's, it's intense between them physically uh -huh. and then plowing through 10 inches of dirt. Wow. And one of, the, one of our, one of the movers, Anna Panol expressed one time, I'm so frustrated because I can't be virtuosic in this space. Cause every time I put my foot in the dirt and try something, I, you know, my foot slides. And I, and so we've actually had to think about virtuosity different. Uh -huh. How can we be athletic and virtuosic in a space that's resisting easy? Yeah. Movement? So, yeah. I mean, I think that's, I'm not giving you a tidy answer, but that's I'm, okay. I'm trying to give it an, an answer, which is, I think the pathway is in the fact that each one of those movers creates a facet of meaning mm -hmm. for the audience to watch, to respond to. Mm -hmm. The fact that there is a moment at the end where we're, we're asked the question is, can someone get out of this? What does that look like? And do they get pulled back in? Is there ever, is, what is this uh -huh. cycle? I do think also looking at the cycle of it and embracing that is also a way to potentially shift it. I don't know, I don't know if I can say break it because I don't know if we yeah. break cycles uh -huh. of violence because they exist so ma in so many places. But again, I think we're really trying to create that thoughtful space for introspection, uh -huh. for engagement. We're certainly going to, Pretty much any time we perform this piece, we will sit with the audience for however long they want Just to talk about it. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And so there's a lot of opportunity for that. This is a piece that people are applauding and cheering. What does that even mean? Because yeah. <laughs> the audience was very yeah. receptive on Saturday. Yeah. And what does that even mean? Was it because because one one of the things I also really think is important is we don't we don't want the company to be viewed as heroes. We okay. want to be like at times heroic, but at other times very vulnerable and and maybe even yeah. weak. So it's just to kind of show the permutations of what this does to be. And I think maybe one answer is I feel like we're actually holding a mirror to ourselves mm -hmm. in a very honest way. And I think the an observer is going to experience that. And so in the end, our we don't have answers for you, but we have the opportunity to bring up emotions and yeah. very real questions about how do I want to relate to this idea of forever war, of how we've enshrined violence and romanticized it quite often yeah. in our, how do we, 
how do we actually engage that in a different conversation? Yeah. No, that it sounds it sounds really fascinating. I'm glad to know that you have the audience talk back at mm -hmm. the at, you know at the end to have a discussion like that. You know, as as I'm listening to it as well, we're talking about this constant state. What would or have you ever thought of a piece that is about you, know, you reach that level of peace where there there isn't that battle going on? Have you ever explored that? Yeah, that's an interesting question for me. I would say that I have not yet found my way to a to a world or an aesthetic place in myself where the primary energy is peace and ease. Okay. It actually almost makes me tear up because I realize that so much of of my worldview and experiences that I've had have been driven by kind of a, aggressive and volatile um, spaces. There is gentleness in my work. There's gentleness mm -hmm. in battleground, mm -hmm. um, and in all in all of all of my works. But they, I tend to embed that gentle and calm and ease in a larger context mm -hmm. of multiple layers of, yeah. of energy, so that it's in reflection to maybe a, a more difficult energy and a more challenging yeah. space. Um, but I haven't sat in a piece that is really focused on that. I think it'd be hard for me. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping, yeah. you know, just, I, I think you can do it. Yeah. And I say that be only because, you know, when I hear you talk, I feel like it's moving in that direction. Like when I, when I, you know, learn about your background and, everything you've done in your background up to this point, including, you know, as an attorney for social justice, you know, that's been your fight. That's been your cause, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. so that is your, that's your world, right? Yeah. And then you're always, you know, for the fighting for that underdog, fighting that, that yeah. conversation. And yeah. then, and so when I hear you saying that, I say, wow, I want you to get to, yeah, yeah. you know, that's like to have that, that out that experience of peace that yeah. experience i don't mean like oh you're not peaceful i mean just <laughs> to to have no. i don't know you you know but i just oh, no, like, I, I i hear you i hear that what a beautiful so, you know sorry what a beautiful i think experience that would be to come out on the other side because there's well, that I, constant search i will say i mean i joyfully you know the lucky father of three beautiful young women in my life and children are in so many ways that peaceful world yeah. i mean of course they're also volatile yeah. and opinionated yeah, and all yes. those things you know they my relationship to them our moments are, are uh, have been incredibly grounding and peaceful cool. experiences just the idea of holding a baby of even holding you know hugging your 22 year old yeah. who's with life yeah and and how how that kind of that has so i have that beautiful humanity sitting yeah. in my world my my with my children and and my lovely life partner emily who are in, in uh for uh i didn't mention we met in the limon oh great see that um we actually met the very first day i joined the, the company we were put into a duet we wow. didn't come about as a as a couple for about two a little over a year and a half but but yeah so it's have i have a lot of those beautiful spaces and it does exist in the work it's intriguing because my a scientific collaborator david odie we went to out to breakfast with him our managing director sharisa oy and i and he started the conversation by saying well we're having a meeting in june we want you to attend about the rules of life and and he said it with just this beautiful just frankness and it, which I just find glorious with scientists like they mm -hmm. just like in the dance world if someone says I'm going to make a piece about the rules of life people are going to go what you know yes. who are you you know and and and, and, I, and I and I was like David we need to stop you just said that you guys are going to be defining the rules of life in June yeah. and I said I think you just created the next project for Black Label Movement. So our next project is actually, we're currently writing grants for an evening like piece called The Rules of Life. How beautiful. If we think of that and, and how that's going to relate to our scientific re relationships and multiple others, 
maybe I'll finally get that chance to do the gentle piece inside. Yes. Of it. I think it's exciting. I just, I, I love to hear all these multiple layers that you have and the brain you have. It's always going, I imagine, you know, which is, I think is fascinating. You know, it, I think it, that's what lends to the levels, I think, in the uniqueness and the profoundness of your work. And I think you must require that of both your students and your dancers to, yeah. to really reach to those depths, which just makes the work very rich, I imagine. Well, I think it's valuable to mention that, you know, Battleground, I mean, I, I have been blown away by the 10 artists that I've been working with. Um, there's nine in the cast and an understudy. Um, their commitment to the push of this piece has been extraordinary because this is black label. Have you seen the physicality? Black label movement asks a lot of our, of our uh, movers. Um, but this piece with the with the ten inches of dirt, I mean, when they're done with this piece, they are literally Helping. the effort of the piece is literally written on their body and their okay. clothing, and and then you know some of it is you know just there's a, a scene where one of them just digs a diagonal six inches deep all the way across, and the timing is just the timing it takes to do that, and yeah. it's exhausting, and and so. They're they're pushing themselves to a physical edge mm-hmm. and also an emotional edge because of the, the the soup of ideas and we've had to do a lot of processing sometimes really just say yes today we need three hours of just talking and yeah. and figuring out where we are I mean again that's that place of you don't do work like this without trying to find an immense amount of trust and care mm-hmm. yeah. If you're doing it without that, it actually becomes, I would raise questions about whether you are being healthy and, yeah. and keeping up your community. And, you know, and this piece is, has us on an edge. It's like, I yeah. think there are times we just have to say, stop, what are we doing? Yeah. But, but I do believe because we're sitting at that edge, mm-hmm. something's coming out in this piece that. It sounds it. feels like we're, 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 we're grasping for something deeper than even expected from us yeah yeah which i i i hear that i hear it i really get the sense of that and this this is happening on uh, october 11th through the 13th correct yeah at it, the yeah. american dance festival right yeah it's it, we're closing adf's um 2024 20, season Excellent. and the exciting thing is the piece is happening on a uh, farm on the outskirts of Durham, North Carolina, called uh, Bahama Blueb's um, Farm. It's a a pick-your-own blueberry farm. Well, fun. And ADF and the farm is going to be digging another. Some of the things that we've had as great gifts is the Northrop Auditorium here on the University of Minnesota campus, which is one of uh, of the, you know, kind of cornerstone dance presenters in the United States. facilitated having a, a 30 by 30 foot pit dug on the west lawn next to the the, the wow. north row so that's where we've been able to rehearse all summer wow and now that pit is going to be uh, rep- replicated at at the bahama blue Ebbs farm and it's just a, i mean one of the big questions i'm having right now is how do you go back into a studio after you've been making in 10 inches of dirt it's it's yeah. it's it's transformative i mean i'll Although Which I think what, also, so we'll look forward to not having dirt and yes, every nook right, and cranny. Every nook and cranny. Which yeah. is what dance is supposed to be, transformative, right? Sure. So my question, this is just a random question. What are they going to do with that pit when you're finished? Well, so one of the things that's really cool about this is, so we, we basically, the pit is dug out. And in North Carolina, we're actually getting, needing them to bring in topsoil. Uh-huh. It's actually, I know more about top, uh, about soil combinations than I ever expected. So you can't just use black dirt or topsoil because when you just put topsoil in, even if it's nice, you, we have two rototillers. We hand uh-huh. rototill the whole thing. When you rototill, it's all nice and fluffy. But if it's just black dirt, it will pack down in about three to oh. five and okay. be almost as hard as a, as, a, as a floor. Wow. And so we have learned that you have to have a mixture. And so the mixture we're going with down in Durham is, 50% topsoil and 50% this ground up pine bark, oh, which nice. we will lend to a, the the right fluffiness. 
it maintains its softness and but it's real it's real and yeah. the, you know that this this is an, an issue it's what i built a initial facility out in some land that um, we have in wisconsin and we have the and, and each place has had different soil issues so we it's always kind of this mixture of how do we get the right right blend and it's been raining oh. off and on throughout the summer here so we've also had to figure out how to keep the soil from getting too wet because yeah. it will turn blood. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. The long and short of it is that the, um, the dirt that is now in the pit next to Northrop, mm -hmm. where she, the Northrop, um, uh, leadership and I are hoping that actually we could maybe plant it with flowers or some That's type of hoping. garden yeah. so that in the spring it grows up. Cause how, talk about a different way to end the piece in the long yeah. term. That space becomes a space of beauty and life. Yes. After the winter, um, the the Bahama Blue Ups Farm folks, you know, they're going to turn it into whatever they want. Maybe yeah. they actually put the blueberries in there, yeah. or maybe they turn it back to the pasture land it is. It's very. We've tried to make this the pit a low impact experience on mm -hmm. the surrounding landscape yeah i think that's really great i was hoping it was gonna you know flourish into something whether it was planted in memoriam or just you know how great to walk past that all the time and know that's where yeah perhaps life was figured out right figured it out in the pit right well or or or, or connecting to that that beautiful reality that you know places where horrible things happen in nature a battlefield, a genocide, a massacre, uh, you know, or or just natural violent events, yeah. forest fires, things like that. Yeah. The beauty is within six months you see life returning. Life returning. That doesn't in any way mean the bad things or the hard things didn't happen. Yeah. But it does give you that sensibility, that Sense renewal. Renewal. Yeah. Yeah. I. I. It, you know, Carl, it's it's fascinating. This has been a fascinating conversation. And Battleground sounds fascinating. Um, is there anything before we finish up that you'd like to leave the listeners with or that I haven't touched upon that you want to put out there for everybody? Yeah, I mean, I, I would just say if you have a chance, um, we're hoping this this piece has a life beyond ADF and certainly is going to have a life here in the Twin Cities again, hopefully next spring. But if, if what you've heard today intrigues you, but also goes, wow, this sounds super intense and scary. Also understand that we are really interested in the humanity of this work. And that's one of the places where we're trying to find a way of moving through the hard to find to find hopeful questions and, and answers to some of these things. So come and see us, come and ask questions, come and challenge the heck out of us because there is no doubt that this piece will not challenge sensibilities um, and people's will have questions about what the heck are you doing? But I think the one thing to know is that we are ready for those questions and willing to have those conversations. So come and come and just engage us in every way you can. Yeah. Well, thank you, Carl, for joining me. Come back anytime, you know, when you're working on something new, we can talk about it some more. Um, yeah. This is Dan's Talk with Joanne Carey. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Follow us, like us, and share, share, share. Thank you. Thank you. Powered by Riverside.